Now, let us begin the second session of the Midterm Academic Dialogue in 2020. I would like to welcome all participants and audiences. This session will be led by Ajin Choi, professor at Yonsei University. From now on, I will hand over microphone to Professor Choi. Okay, thank you for your introduction. I am Ajin Choi, professor at Yonsei University, Seoul. And I will serve as a moderator for the second session, COVID-19 and promoting multilateralism and global health security. Before actually this session starts, I would like to thank the KAIS president, Professor Yi Sang Hwan, and conference organizers for inviting me to this timely and important meeting. As you know, the first, the first session discussed the macro level change and uh, prospects of the post COVID global order. But this second session will more focus on the practical practical and more concrete issues by looking at the role of the MICTA in promoting multilateral health governance and cooperation. I hope this panel can provide and exchange important ideas and eventually produce the constructive policy alternatives. This, this session, we have two presenters and three discussants. So I'm happy to introduce all the panelists. And then first, panelist is the Professor Ibi Fitriani from Indonesia University. And the second presenter is the Professor Emel Parar and Mamar Dal University in Turkey. And the first the discussant is Hyunjin Choi, Gyeonggi University, Korea. And the second discussant is the Caitlin Byrne, from Griffiths University from Australia. And then last discussant is the Professor Erika Sandoval at SEED in Mexico. You know, I'm very happy to see all of you here. And then our, so therefore I, I would like to ask the, our first presenters to speak. And, and then the title of her presentation is MICTA Spons uh, Multilateral Cooperation in the Pandemic Era. Professor Abby Fitrani, could you start, please? Thank you, Professor Choi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the conference organizer who already invited me for this important uh, webinar. I'm pleased from Jakarta. I would like to send a very warm uh, greetings to all of you. My presentation is about uh, this, uh, actually I put question mark at the end of my question uh, title. So it's I'm kind of asking uh, can can Mika uh, form a multilateral cooperation multilateral cooperation uh, to to tackle uh, uh, challenges uh, resulted from this uh, pandemic, but uh, to explain my uh, thoughts uh, better, I would like to use uh, the slide. Uh, so I will share with you my slides. Can you see uh, the slides? Yes, okay. Uh, so I put a uh, question mark at the end, but let me explain, yeah. I will go through very sh quickly. Uh, five, uh, should be five uh, steps. Uh, just would like to see, before I'm looking at Mikta, uh, I would like to see the, it, uh, the, the, the world in this uh, pandemic era, which is very special time in our history. Uh, and uh, whether I would like thankful or not, we are now in the, this kind of circumstances. And from previous session this morning, uh, they have been, uh, a discussion, if I cannot see it's a, it's a debate about whether MICTA uh, still have time to materialize or to be a middle power. But I'm kind of agree with those who think that there is always possibility. Uh, big, powers con uh, big powers competition is not the whole world. Uh, there is still room for MICTA for middle power uh, to uh, maneuver and to find a way. And this is what I understand, my understanding of uh, international relation in pandemic era. 
we uh, suddenly in a crisis of global healthcare system, not only in one or two countries, but across the country, not only in a underdeveloped countries, but even in the most advanced country experience that. So this is the first. And the second, we found that state very much inward looking now, even the countries that used to be form a coalition or even in a regional institutions, you can see uh, people, uh, countries now try to pro pro prioritize their own uh, needs and national interests. And uh, 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 vaccine nationalism is one of the example of that. And of course, we then, because of this problem, we are following, uh, we are watching now and experiencing now global economic crisis. And on the top of all those uh, very uh, difficult circumstances, we can still see the continuing strategic competition between major powers. It is not only in the a, in a, in a problem of the competing on the vaccine and, uh, and blaming where the virus come from, but also, uh, but also on the area that should not be discussed or not be not become the problem in this time, like uh, things in uh, South China Sea. So this is a very, very difficult circumstances. And we experienced, the, because our session will tackle on this uh, pandemic era, I would like to see the problem of our global health system. Uh, for sure, we have uh, capitalization of health services and medical equipments. And it's very much uh, remarkable because our world also have a majority of the world is poor and do not have access enough access, a good access to the health service and medical equipments. And we have seen that not only in not only in uh, major countries but also in small countries. Uh, not sorry, not only in small countries but also in major countries happen. And uh, we can still see the future is not free from uh, health problems. And some of the epidemiologues already predict that there will be more and some more epidemic in the future. So actually uh, what I think what we need is uh, the need for fair and inclusive global health governance. So our session uh, this time is very, I think indeed uh, very in time. Uh, how about Mikta? Uh, some discussion this morning has uh, so, uh, this morning so session already so some debate, but this is my position. Uh, we each of our our countries, Mikta, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia, overwhelmed by our domestic health and economic problems. Not only because it is uh, we are not ready, but also there are so many complications domestically, and uh, not only pressure from external, but also pressure from internal society, especially in the domestic. Uh, democratic country. I found it's more democratic country is more difficult. At least for Indonesia, it is much more difficult to handle this issue in a democratic circumstances. If you are in a authoritarian system, maybe it's easy to just impose rules and ban people and lockdown. But not in democratic country, you will get a lot of protests. So this is very challenging. And but uh, in on the uh, in this amidst that circumstances. MICTA countries still struggle for strategic autonomy. And this somehow was related to the debate this morning in the first session, but whether MICTA uh, can be uh, autonomy uh, apart from those two major powers. But for my, my position is, yes, uh, somehow we struggle for the strategic autonomy, but some manage to get it, but some not. Uh, we have to uh, go, I don't think, generalization for all middle powers that cannot avoid that uh, bipolar uh, circumstances uh, is the right thing to, to say. But for me, some of the middle powers manage to get it. That's, that's depend on the tradition, philosophy, and history of that country. Some countries do not see the possibility to be more independent because they have never independent since they're independent uh, since since they are existent in their country. But some country manage uh, to get uh, experience and uh, to be more uh, uh, strategically autonomy uh, uh, in their history. So this is my and uh, unfortunately 
our MICTA is not a close partnership. It is an uh, association for the last several years, but it is not yet a close partnership, unless for some cases, and this is more on bilateral base, like Indonesia and Korea is quite close and we have strategic partnership. And during this pandemic, uh, Korea helped Indonesia with some of the medical equipments. Indonesia also have special relation with Australia, uh, we have also a strategic partnership. We just finished uh, uh, SEPA. But apart from that, uh, as a part of MICTA, five countries working together, uh, I don't think we have uh, achieved uh, what has been expected before. Uh, so uh, uh, in this kind of circumstances, uh, can we, uh, MICTA, uh, promote multilateral cooperation uh, in order to to work especially toward the global, a better global health uh, system. Uh, we, I think we have to see uh, our strength and our strength is the, uh, still relevance as a group of middle power. MIGTA, I think still relevance, uh, apart from the, a lot of pessimism. Uh, yes, I think still relevant because uh, it is the time uh, when the multilateral is needed and who has the potential to do it, middle power. Who else? Uh, small power will be much more difficult. So as a country that have some uh, capability uh, especially, and also leading in their respective region, uh, MICTA is still a relevant uh, a group of middle powers. And the second, the strength of MITA is the power of network. We have a lot of network already, Indonesia with Korea, Indonesia with uh, uh, Australia, Indonesia with uh, Turkey, have quite a lot of uh, that maybe with Mexico because of the distance quite far away, not as developed as the relation network relations with Korea and Australia, but I'm sure with more interaction and even discussion like this already put up in some networks. So I think the power of network among MICTA has growing, has been growing. And the, sec the third one, we have a soft image. We are not uh, such a uh, 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 aggressive, uh, in, not in an aggressive mode. We are uh, friendly countries and we would like to cooperate. So this is, I think, important. And uh, countries in MICTA are generally flexible. We have a flexible approach and somehow we have a realistic goals because we understand that we are not big power. So we, 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 we would like to target what we possibly can achieve. Uh, Finally, uh, st the strength of MICTA is some countries, MICTA, if not all, have a, a, some innovation of healthcare and develop medical health industries. I would like to mention Korea and Australia for this uh, aspect uh, because uh, countries, uh, those two countries already uh, experience uh, more advanced economy. And so they have more advanced healthcare and uh, medical industries too. But I'm sure uh, the pandemic also pushed countries like Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey to also think um, and invest more on their healthcare system. So we can expect a better response to this uh, health system. So, but we have also a lot of challenges, even though I'm not a uh, 100% pessimist, I can still uh, see some problems in Amikta's uh, co collaboration to provide or to build a fair and inclusive global health system. First is uh, some of us, not all, have a close link or even dependent on major powers. Uh, it is unavoidable in this current of circumstances, but uh, the, the closeness with the major power somehow uh, challenge the uh, uh, strategic autonomy of MICTA countries. And the second is lack of pooling resources. We, uh, apart from uh, intellectual discussion or uh, almost there is no uh, pooling resources among MICTA countries. So this is so loose, so, so loose. And maybe because of that, maybe it is not time yet. It is only several years, uh, this association will, uh, uh, on se several years. So maybe we still need time to develop this kind of association. And because maybe we are in different area, there is still thin common interest. 
there's country like Indonesia, Korea, and Australia that have more interaction in ASEAN plus plus uh, is in East Asia Summit, but uh, and even in ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus one. But apart from that, especially with Mexico and, and Turkey, uh, the the interest is still very very thin. Uh, there is maybe because each of us are very uh, uh, engage in our respective area. And the fourth is uh, there are also other mechanisms, uh, regional associations. So MICTA is not the the I have to say uh, MICTA is not the first priority for Indonesia, for example. ASEAN is the first pri first priority for collaboration, and ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus one is another mechanism that we still think as a priority. MICTA maybe come uh, after that. So it is not uh, the, the 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 association that uh, become. Uh, the first priority if it comes to our foreign policy. So there, and uh, don't forget, there's also still bilateral mechanism and other multilateral forum. So uh, the existence of MICTA in a country like Indonesia is still being questioned. Uh, because of that, uh, MICTA have a weak coalition. So co cooperation like us, like this, what we are doing now among the schools is I think uh, one of the good steps to, to to, to enhance uh, make the existence uh, to face these challenges. So I would like to conclude my presentation uh, with uh, two, uh, two things. One is that COVID-19 pandemic has created multifaceted global crisis that uh, threaten not only future survival of the state, but also uh, the human being ourselves. And under these circumstances, um, uh, it is, uh, to compete for their interest in the domain and create magnitude challenge. And this is consensus create magnitude challenge to multilateralism. But nevertheless, it is a general knowledge that if we would like to survive, we have to collaborate. So, and multilateral cooperation is the best way to do it. And MICTA has frequently overlooked, uh, uh, I'm sorry, MICTA has frequent, uh, frequently overlooked potential. We have a lot of potential, but often, frequently overlooked. So it is uh, maybe this time is a good time. Now crisis usually pulls uh, and drive a lot of opportunity. So it is time for MICTA to realize its potential and to promote, especially to promote multilateral co cooperation. Uh, however, MICTA have individual problems and collective weaknesses to material is promised. So it's kind of challenge and but also opportunity. And I think two things is in the front of MICTA that if possible, we should collaborate. One is about the, to create fair and inclusive global governance. And the second is how to tackle this financial crisis. With this, I would like to stop and thank you very much for your patience and your attention. Thank you. I will now... Uh, send the uh, uh, back to professor choi thank you okay okay thank you for your presentation and professor petriani shows that in the face of the pandemic crisis, the world is becoming more polarized and less developed countries has no enough capabilities or resources, while the great powers is more focused on the domestic agendas and also you know, focus on the competition with each other, increasing protectionism and national sentiment. She also points out that under this circumstance, the middle powers has strengths but at the same time, weakness in overcoming this, you know, pandemic crisis. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Our next presenter is the Professor Emel Paradar at Marmar, Marmara, Marmara University in Turkey. Okay, it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Korean Minister of Foreign Affairs and Korean Association of International Studies uh, for having organized uh, such a great uh, academic event on MICTA and its future. And also, I would like to thank you for having invited me to this event. Uh, as the title of my, I don't know if the technical staff will share my, because they told me yesterday that they'll share my PowerPoint uh, presentation, but anyway, I'll share it myself. Is it okay now? Okay, yes. Just... Yes. Uh, could you see it? Yes. Huh, okay. Um, but I have to. F Sorry, I think there is a problem here. Sorry. Huh. Okay. 
Uh, as the title of my presentation suggests, I'll talk uh, about middle powers and their uh, role and their potentialities and limitations in uh, global health governance more specifically. And of course, uh, as, the, uh, as we will focus on NICTA, I will focus on NICTA as our case study. Um, Let's look at the outline of my presentation. First of all, I will uh, talk about a little bit, of course, uh, uh, and uh, about uh, the revival of middle power diplomacy. And I will investigate whether we will be able to um, investigate whether MICTA can contribute to this revival and whether can uh, MICTA uh, increase, uh, whether can MICTA increase its visibility and status in global uh, governance. Uh, in this post-corona era. Then I will try to draw a general picture of uh, MICTAS uh, and MICTA countries' uh, position uh, in global health governance, and I'll provide some inward and outward uh, looking patterns of uh, MICTA and MICTA members' uh, uh, position in global health governance. Then I'll uh, investigate whether uh, global health governance can be a new, dip uh, new dish niche diplomacy area uh, for MICTA. Of course, here I will talk about its potentialities and limitations. And in the last part, I will try to give some recommendations. Um, in this part, uh, I will start by saying that uh, the coronavirus pandemic has made clear that there is room uh, for middle powers uh, to play a greater role in global governance, especially in global health governance. So my departing point is that, and I believe that, and I argue that uh, the ongoing strategic unraveling in the international system may allow middle powers to create a, a common ground for both improve, improving political and economic ties among states and enc encouraging trade and investment and combating global problems. So uh, uh, I am on the op optimistic side, and I think that there is still room for middle powers to revive and to come together and to uh, respond together to global challenges like uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, on the other hand, they have, of course, some limitations. Uh, first of all, middle powers will do better if they pool uh, their resources to, uh, to create a multilateral, multilateralist league uh, that will serve as an external block. And uh, as you know, uh, established institutions are too much reliant on US and China. And uh, UN and US and China dispute is widening and structures uh, outside US and China, uh, Chinese participations are becoming uh, even more important for an effective global governance. So for the effectiveness of, for an effective global, for an effective multilateralism, we need other structures, we need other powers who will uh, engage in these um, uh, new multilateral era. So MICTA, I argue that MICTA is one of these platforms as an informal uh, international institution. It, it has potential to take concrete steps and, to, uh, and it can reinforce post-COVID alliances and partnerships among emerging and middle powers. As a group being composed of middle powers, of course, we call it we generally in literature, we contextualize uh, MICTA as a middle power, uh, middle power uh, group, in middle power institution. Uh, it can uh, revive uh, middle power activism uh, in two main uh, areas, global and sustainable development and global health governance. In fact, since 2013, since its foundation, MICTA has failed to create impact both among its members and in other international institutions and platforms. Uh, for instance, a good sign of MICTA's failure in club governance is uh, is that its members do not still organize side events or mini submits in the G20 annual submits as did the BRICS countries. In short, MICTA is not sufficiently visible in other uh, formal international institutions like UN. Uh, it's not too visible in UN General Assembly, for example, uh, and in other UN institutions, funds and agencies, and also uh, in, in the G20. However, I, I still believe that there is still room for MICTA to revive and to play distinct roles in the post-COVID era as did Canada and Australia in the post, uh, in the post to Second World War. Uh, now I will look at uh, the important uh, outward patterns of uh, MICTA's uh, power in global governance, because in this session you will uh, mainly focus on global governance, a uh, global health governance. Uh, here uh, I'm using a table and I'm, I try to compare uh, MICTA's members' um, inward patterns. So, so I look, I put their total deaths 
current assessment of SDG three, SDG trend uh, position, and also I uh, put uh, their current ex health expansion per capita, and also I look at uh, whether they have universal health coverage uh, or not. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 outbreak has clearly shown the importance of state capacity and resilience of, uh, of national health systems. And domestic health policies of states have determined both how they responded to COVID-19 outbreak and at what degree they have been affected by the virus. So we must, first of all, look at whether NICTA members uh, succeeded in responding uh, to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So uh, as you see, in the table, Korea and Australia appear as the top two countries among five MICTA countries who have successfully achieved the SDG3 target and efficiently managed the COVID crisis. Among five MICTA countries, these two countries have the lowest mortality rate. On the other hand, Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey stand as MICTA countries who have been respectively the most negatively affected uh, by the COVID-19 in terms of no number of deaths uh, caused by the virus. In terms of their SDG3 performance, these three countries uh, appear to have the lowest performance, I'm talking about Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey, of course, in achieving SDG3, while Korea and Australia uh, maintain the highest SDG3 achievement. SDG3 refers to the uh, health sector, of course. Uh, in case MITA members can sign uh, health cooperation agreements among each other and further foster their knowledge and experience sharing in health sector, it's likely that their capacity to take action against the future outbreaks uh, would, be, would considerably improve. So uh, a significant increase in the health capacity of MICTA countries will certainly make the grouping bring the uh, global governance, uh, global health governance to the agenda of, their, of the other international organizations, formal or informal, and push MICTA to launch projects for the third countries willing to improve their domestic health capacity. COVID-19 outbreak has also negatively influenced the implementation of SDG3 um, at, in, at the national level. So uh, countries like uh, MICTA members uh, have a potential uh, to uh, help uh, other uh, the third countries uh, to improve uh, their uh, national capacities and, or, and surveillance capacities. When I look at the universal health coverage uh, of the MICTA members, uh, all the MICTA members uh, have universal health coverage. Uh, among these five uh, MICTA members, Mexico appears the one who achieved universal health coverage uh, the most recently, uh, in 2019, Indonesia, I think, uh, uh, could achieve uh, um, universal health coverage, although it has some uh, finance, uh, finance, financing problems uh, regarding uh, universal health coverage. When I look at the outward-looking uh, patterns of MICTA in global health governance, uh, first of all, I look at MICTA's commitment, MICTA's commitment to uh, global health governance, here I look at the uh, MICTA foreign minister's uh, joint statements on COVID-99 and I compare uh, this uh, commitment, this uh, recent commitment with MICTA's uh, commitment on uh, uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014. And in my, in the present, in my paper also, I compare MICTA's uh, commitment to global health governance with the uh, joint statement made by BRICS uh, in June uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, I, when I compare these two uh, statements, MICTA's statement on uh, COVID-19 and BRICS statement on COVID-19, I found out that uh, BRICS statement uh, proposed much more concrete solutions uh, to respond to the crisis uh, in a joint way. Uh, and, um, uh, but in general, their focus is similar. Uh, they, they focus on uh, better trade relations and how to and they uh, to, uh, try to find responses, common responses uh, to uh, cover uh, their trade loss. Uh, and they and different from uh, MICTA statement, uh, BRIC statement uh, suggested uh, to um, on big MICTA statement underlined the necessity to. Uh, use uh, the loan, their emergency loan system. And uh, also they pointed out that a new development bank uh, could help uh, BRICS countries affected by the virus, uh, uh, some sort of uh, new uh, funds. 
So these are uh, related with the MIGTAS commitment to uh, global health governance. Uh, and as a second step in this part, I look at MIGTA countries' voluntary contribution to the World Health Organization. In my opinion, and uh, as I and, and I studied these uh, in my previous um, uh, projects, uh, countries' voluntary contribution to World Health Organization or to global governance is very much is, is very is very much important uh, to understand whether uh, they would like to play greater role in uh, in some issue uh, specific issue areas. So uh, this contribution, this voluntary contribution, is a sign of uh, countries' uh, willingness uh, to play. A role in this specific uh, issue area. So when I look at uh, this commitment uh, of vo voluntary, commit voluntary contribution of uh, MICTA countries, I see that South Korea took the first place, then uh, it is followed by Australia, Turkey, Indonesia, and Mexico. And so uh, Mexico appears uh, to be the lowest uh, contributor, a uh, voluntary contributor uh, to the World Health Organization. Uh, here, perhaps I yeah, I have a table, uh, so you can see the numbers. Uh, here, I couldn't find relevant data uh, regarding uh, Mexico's uh, uh, um, voluntary contribution to World Health Organization. Uh, so when you look at the data, you will understand uh, which countries have willingness to play a greater role in World Health Organization. Um, so uh, in this part, uh, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the potentialities and limitations of MICTA, and I'll investigate whether global health governance can be a new diplomacy, new niche diplomacy area for uh, the grouping. Um, I think uh, we must, first of all, keep in mind that uh, during the pandemic, uh, intergroup relations uh, of MICTA uh, were fostered as a result of increasing exchange of medical supplies and the knowledge sharing among MICTA members, which can be considered a positive result of MICTA's minilateralism. And I argue that minilateralism is very, is very important for fostering multilateralism. Informal governance, on the other hand, is very much important for, uh, uh, for an effective multilateralism. So uh, as a scholar, I think that if uh, these uh, minilateral groupings uh, the activities of military groupings uh, develop, uh, we, could, we could have much more efficient multilateral uh, governance. Um, in this regard, if MICTA establishes linkage between its global de development agenda and its global health diplomacy and succeeds succeed in establishing a human security network composed of states and NGOs, it would raise its profile and visibility in global governance. So these are the positive uh, sides of uh, MICTA, MICTA's uh, uh, contribution to, or MICTA's uh, capacities uh, regarding global, uh, in health gov governance. International development, as you know, is one of the priorities of MICTA as a grouping. And uh, two thirds of uh, MICTA's uh, declarations, joint statements are related with international and sustainable, de sustainable development. And if, if MICTA could succeed in establishing a linkage between these two niche areas, uh, uh, global development and uh, global health governance, I think uh, it could find room uh, to uh, move ahead uh, in this new uh, uh, issue area. Uh, another aspect regarding uh, potentiality of MICTA is uh, the fact that international development assistance is needed so that developing countries can make rapid progress in building national surveillance capacities. And I think that MICTA countries with their extensive capabilities and networks in the field of development assistance might help developing countries increase their national capacities to take control and manage outbreaks by increasing health sector allocations in their individual development aid. MICTA countries may also consider including private aid into their broader development assistance. The inclusion of special assistance may be effective in both promoting general health and using human development tools effectively. So I think that MICTA countries have, uh, are important players in the, in, the, uh, in the international development area. And if they could uh, 
collaborate uh, in this uh, specific uh, issue area uh, to give common resp response to the third countries, which have uh, less uh, resources. Uh, I think uh, NICTA can increase its status as a uh, club in global governance. So what is net next for NICTA in the post-pandemic time? Here I will uh, try to give some recommendations for NICTA's adaptation to the new era. Uh, the pandemic has proven right that middle powers have capacity to balance their economic vulnerabilities with resilience, especially in the global health sector. Uh, and uh, the assessment of MICTA's uh, inward and outward looking shows that MICTA has potential to play a larger role uh, in global health governance. If global health governance will be added to MICTA's agenda as the new policy era, area, uh, despite its risks, uh, of course, it can help energize and transform the platform into the post-pandemic era. The pandemic has proven right that middle powers have capacity to balance their economic vulnerabilities with their uh, strong uh, health sector, as I said. Uh, so uh, MICTA, if MICTA countries and MICTA itself uh, can, uh, can succeed in narrowing the gap between uh, the, its rhetoric and uh, practice, it can assume new responsibilities in global health governance, most, pa most particularly in the field of development assistance for health. And this may take, uh, this, may, this can, can make MICTA more visible and operational uh, in global health governance. I am also suggesting or recommending uh, uh, to MICTA members to, to, to think about the creation of a fund similar to BRICS emergency assistance loan. Uh, of course, they have all uh, budgetary restrictions, but uh, they can discuss uh, whether it's possible to have such an emergency loan as uh, mixed countries uh, uh, did or found. And this, uh, this kind of loan may also help make the countries comply with their G20 commitments and strengthen global health diplomacy within the G20. MICTA may also prepare a global health working uh, global health work program in order to encourage joint dialogue, dialogue and participation within the G20 by working in coordination with, with key actors such as the World Health Organization and the World Bank who influence the global health agenda. In addition to this, if MICTA members take decisive steps to reinforce cooperation within the grouping in order to reach the targets of uh, Agenda 2030, uh, and actively engage in health financing and development support, support programs. MICTA can update its status as an informal institution aiming to contribute to the strengthening of rules-based multilateralism. Um, um, last but not least, global health governance has now become truly multipolar with many players with converging and diverging interests, in what ways informal international institutions can contribute to global health governance still remains uh, as an un uh, underexplored topic. So as scholars, if uh, we can uh, debate and analyze uh, more uh, this kind of uh, topics, I think we can also contribute to uh, the strengthening of uh, MICTA uh, in uh, global governance, and we can also contribute to the increasing uh, of its uh, image and visibility uh, in, um, in the changing uh, global uh, governance. MICTA, in this sense, may be a good research topic for two main reasons. First, it its members have a good record of dealing with the pandemic compared to some higher income countries in the West. Second, MICTA needs a revival so as, to be, so as to be an effective club, which can take new initiati initiatives in specific policy areas, such as sustainable development and global health governance. However, in order to be a legitimate actor in the eyes of international public opinion, MICTA members must also work harder so that their COVID-19 policies will not result in both weakening of democratic norms and practices and the strengthening of authoritarian politics in their own countries and elsewhere. Thank you very much for having uh, listened. Okay, thank you for your presentation. And Professor Paraldar argues that with respect to the global health governance, MICTA countries individually have specific cap capacity to the combat with the combat against the pandemic 
And at the same time, the nature of the middle power diplomacy has merits in promoting multilateral cooperation in global health care uh, health governance. Sorry. And now we actually move on to the discussion sections. And the first discussion discussant is the Professor Hyun Jin Choi from Gyeonggi University, Korea. He will give the comments on the first paper, the, the Professor Fitnani's presentation. And could you start, please? Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Hyun Jin Choi from Gyeonggi University. Uh, first of all, it's my uh, great honor to speak uh, on this important topic in this uncertain time of pandemic crisis. So uh, now I'm going to discuss about Professor uh, Fitriani's uh, presentation about multilateral uh, cooperation. So she pointed out some important issues about some challenges for multilateral cooperation, such as inward looking countries seeking selfish interests and also uh, many countries are uh, seeking strategic competition as well. So these problems pose a lot of challenges for fair and inclusive multilateral cooperation. Uh, so uh, as noted by Professor uh, Vitriani, this pandemic crisis mm -hmm. can be uh, overcome only through multilateral cooperation. And I believe that no one would deny the importance of a fair and inclusive global health governance in this uncertain time. And we, the members of MICTA, must take a progress towards such an ideal, but the reality is much more complicated. So uh, in this discussion, I want to introduce some kind of challenges uh, against this uh, ideal. And today, the biggest challenge for global health government governance could be how to share and distribute coronavirus vaccine, and which might be available by the end of this year or early next year. Some countries, such as US, China, and the United Kingdom, have secured their own supplies through bilateral deals with vaccine developers ahead of anyone else. And for example, the United Kingdom has pre-ordered enough vaccine for about five doses for a person. And, and many newspapers and magazines and call this behavior as vaccine nationalism or vaccine hoarding. And the WHO also gave a warning that the vaccine nationalism will prolong the pandemic rather than shorten this crisis. And also the science magazine said that those vaccines will eventually will uh, reach most countries in the world, but only after powerful countries have protected their own people. So the question is, can we achieve fair and inclusive allocation of COVID vaccine? And as for now, unfortunately, the answer seems to be negative for the following reasons. And first reason is, the COVID vaccine are private goods. So unlike public goods, those private goods are sold by private companies to earn profit and fulfill the needs of their buyers. And both public goods and private goods are for the benefit of consumers. But while public goods benefit everyone, private goods are only for those who can make a payment. And theories of international relations especially in realism, suggests that achieving multilateral cooperation is much harder when countries are concerned with private goods. And the second problem is domestic politics. Access to coronavirus vaccine has become a priority in domestic politics. In many countries, issues surrounding this COVID crisis has become a domestic political problem. And in the United States, even the issue of where to wear mask or not has become a topic for political debate. And for leaders of high-income countries, especially in democratic countries, securing enough amount of vaccine as a way to recover from uh, economic damage at home is important for their approval ratings and elections. So I think this domestic politics make matters worse. 
And the third issue is the balance of power politics has returned to international relations. The strategic rivalry between US, China, and possibly Russia is shaping national response to COVID-19 crisis in a uh, selfish manner. And the recent New York Times article introduced a story about spying activities between the three great powers in the cyberspace targeting vaccine research facilities in the United States. So in this era of new geopolitical rivalry, we may rephrase all the statements of Kenneth Walsh, a, a great uh, political scientist. So maybe I can say like this, when faced with the possibility of cooperating for COVID vaccine stage, that feel insecure must ask how the vaccine will be divided. And they ask not will both of us gain, but who will gain more? So this kind of strategic rivalry and the return of a balance of power politics makes international cooperation for this COVID crisis difficult. And for these reasons, as of now, I think the fair and inclusive distribution of COVID vaccine will be difficult to achieve. But nevertheless, there is some improvement in multilateral cooperation for global health. And I think this is where uh, we, the middle-income countries, can make a meaningful contribution. So let me give you one example. So recently, led by WHO, more than 170 countries around the world have now joined the global vaccine allocation plan called COVAX. Its goal is to help buy and distribute vaccinations fairly around the world, including low-income countries. Unfortunately, the three great powers, US, China, and Russia, and those countries are also the leaders of vaccine development, and they abstained from this initiative. But in the absence of great powers, the MiGTA and major countries, such as Germany, UK, and Japan, also joined this effort. And we pledged money to have access to a broader range of vaccine candidates. So uh, as the middle power countries, and we have an advanced uh, technology and a lot of experience and knowledge of controlling uh, this infectious disease. And also we have advanced manufacturing facilities for vaccine. And therefore, although it is a tough time for international cooperation, but we can make a contribution for the fair and inclusive uh, distribution of vaccine. And also, we need to remember that without global cooperation, the virus will continue spreading. And therefore, this crisis can give us a lot of challenges for multilateral cooperation. But still, there is some opportunity that middle power countries can make a contribution. OK. OK, thank you, yeah. Professor Choi. And then Professor Choi, Comments is focus focuses on the feasibility and the effectiveness of the you know multilateral cooperation in this you know, in this topic, and then next discussant is the Professor Byrne at Griffiths University from Australia. Could you start, please, Professor? Byrne? Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Is that coming through all right? Great. Excellent. Um, look, good afternoon, all. It's such a pleasure to be joining you and being part of this virtual dialogue. I'm joining you from Brisbane in Australia, and I'd like to extend my thanks very much and congratulations to the Courier Foundation for hosting this dialogue in their year as MICTA chair. It's really good to be a part of it. And Professor Choi, thank you for your excellent chairing. And to all the panellists, uh, really pleased to be part of this discussion. Given that I am sitting here in Brisbane, Australia, I'd like to begin my intervention with an Australian protocol by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm from which I'm joining you today. Here in Brisbane, that's the Turrbal and the Jagera peoples. 
and in the spirit of reconciliation, pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that to all First Nations peoples around the globe. Uh, that's something we do in Australia fairly routinely these days, but it's an acknowledgement that I don't make at all lightly. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to do that to really highlight the relevance of traditional knowledge and local wisdom, uh, particularly from our Indigenous communities and the responsibility that we have in Australia, but across MICTA nations, to highlight and integrate that into our contemporary problem-solving frameworks. So I'd like to just say today's discussion has really been excellent and I think it's offered us a valuable opportunity to think about MICTA and what it stands for and what it might achieve in a post-COVID world, but also to think about what it means to be a middle power uh, and how this connection of nations actually makes sense. Maybe I was a little bit like Phillips Vermont. Uh, he mentioned earlier in the day that he was a little bit sceptical about the power of MICTA. And I've probably been uh, a little bit in that same boat. And then I was thinking about my own personal experiences living in Australia, having been posted to Mexico and spending a couple of years there. Today in my current role uh, with the Asia Institute, working very closely with our biggest neighbour, Indonesia, uh, but also working with colleagues in Korea and, and colleagues right across that, the Asia-Pacific region. And I'm also involved in an engagement group with the G20, the W20, which was really put forward into action by Turkey. So it's interesting when you start to think about the connections that exist. In many ways, they are uneven. Uh, those common interests uh, uh, can be difficult to find and perhaps they are, much like Evi Fitriani mentioned earlier, a little bit thin on the ground, but, but nonetheless they are there and, and evident in different activities uh, that I think each of these nations is engaged in. And I think that's something really positive uh, to work with. And I, and I would note that... Um, Jeffrey Robertson this morning talked in a fairly pessimistic way about the nature of the connections and what Micta might achieve. But I thought in finishing, he was spot on in saying, if we are to make this work, we have to invest in effort, uh, effort into the kinds of dialogues we're having, at, wh at what level they are happening at. We have to invest effort into the way that we can support each other, including at the moment, um, in a current environment where ministries of foreign affairs are under increasing pressure and costs cost to save money, to produce efficiency dividends uh, without necessarily domestic constituencies to support them. Uh, and additionally, where diplomacy is increasingly undervalued, a diplomacy not just in its traditional sense, but of course, across a number of public uh, dimensions as well. And I think Korea is well placed uh, to advance that sense of value in diplomacy. So I think we are in a really difficult uh, situation today in rethinking or reimagining the kind of contribution that MICTA might make in a post-COVID world, in, indeed not just in responding to COVID-19 but in recovery from it. Um, and to this end, I've been asked to comment on uh, my fellow panellist Emil's paper, and I have to say, I'm in complete agreement with your paper, Emil. I thought, you know, what you have done is given us a pathway, a, a model for thinking about what MICTA might take forward in the next couple of years with a particular focus on niche diplomacy through, health, through the lens of health governance. I thought that the approach that you've taken to actually justifying this idea looking at the inward and outward patterns of activity, uh, of compliance, of behaviour, is absolutely critical. And one of the things that I had noticed in going over the past seven years' worth of MICTA activity and dialogue, whether it was at a foreign minister level, at a senior official level, or at an academic level, uh, the, there is such an emphasis on very idealistic, lofty statements of commitment and shared values, but very little self-reflection 
on where each of these nations might be actually coming in to an issue from. And I think it's particularly important for us today in a world where national uh, and domestic priorities are often very blurred with our international activity and behaviours and priorities. We have to find a way to actually look both inwardly uh, and examine our priorities inwardly and our behaviours and outcomes and what that, that means and says about our international behaviours. So I think that's actually a model that could be taken forward in the MICTA process. It's something that we also see at play in the G20 process. And there is uh, excellent work done by the G20 research organization to map and monitor compliance of G20 nations with the commitments that they uh, make through the Leaders' Summit each year. And I think that's something that we should be applying if, if MICTA is to move forward and to be practical uh, and to have impact on the ground. I would absolutely agree, and I think Emil was reflecting uh, the discussion from earlier in the day as well, that when you look at what MICTA has achieved, it is uneven, it is patchy, and impact and effectiveness is not particularly evident in any given field. Um, there are some good statements that have been made, but, but if you look at the activities, particularly around the edges of large multilateral fora, you know, it's, it's a very weak kind of contribution. And that could well be because of an agenda that is simply too unwieldy, that changes from year to year, and that is often driven from issue to issue. So by focusing in on a common issue of concern and global health uh, governance and security, I think, is one that is not just relevant but timely. Uh, where there are complementarities across the different nations, and I think Mel has, has demonstrated that, but there are also gaps uh, both in domestic and international behaviours. Where MICTA uh, may well have an opportunity to drive the agenda forward in a constructive way. And I would also agree that the G20 provides a a mechanism that each of the MICTA nations can contribute to, not just through the leaders of fora and through the different uh, task forces within that G20 structure, but also through those different engagement groups, whether that is civil society, business, uh, looking at women and looking at young people, all groups that have particular interests in how we handle health governance and security going forward. And some of those groups that are particularly vulnerable, and I'm thinking in particular about women, um, business in a small SME and micro capacity, and young people. Um, so in fact, potentially, rather than the UN, it is in the G20 that the MICTA coalition derives the greatest strength so if I were to add a couple of things to uh, this particular health governance agenda going forward, and, and nothing here is out of step with what Amel has put forward already, uh, potentially just to accentuate or, or highlight additional ideas, uh, I would suggest there's a real opportunity here to widen the dialogue beyond political leaders, uh, beyond senior officials that... Uh, tend to be in a very general capacity towards experts. Uh, academics in the international relations and diplomacy space, sure, but also experts in our science and health spaces as well. Potentially even also to, um, if we're thinking about global health governance, to looking at how hospitals, you know, where can we bring a dialogue between hospitals that are achieving outcomes on the ground as well so that they can share best practice and knowledge. And there are those networks, uh, particularly through the One Health Network, that exist that could really be developed. Secondly, I think looking to innovative collaborations um, Again, not just talking about what we're each doing in a research perspective, but actually looking to fund and drive forward collaborative research uh, and practice, again, focusing in on that health, hospital, community health space. Uh, and that could also incorporate an emphasis on, on vaccine development. And I thought the last intervention around vaccines is quite a critical and important one that should be uh, included in this discussion. Thirdly, 
again, to unlock and mobilise capital. Um, we often ask and look to governments to contribute funds uh, for capital investment. I think we should also be involving the private sector in these conversations and philanthropic organisations as well. And thinking creatively about how those funds might be um, might be utilised and invested for collaborative outcomes. And, and finally, to communicate outcomes more widely. One of the things that I think became very clear through the COVID pandemic is that our risk communication in times of pandemics is poor and uh, very fragmented. And we, we can actually develop much more coherent standards and practices within a WHO framework under the international health regulations to improve the kind of risk communication um, that is disseminated from the highest levels right out to grassroots communities. MICTA, with a focus on global health governance, could contribute to that space. Finally, just to conclude, um, I think this is an important agenda item, not just because it's timely and relevant now, but because MICTA is at a point in its existence where being able to demonstrate a track record, being able to demonstrate a common purpose and outcomes is critical to its ongoing existence. But I don't think it should stop there. And I think if, if we are able to strategize and cast forward, there is an opportunity to lift ambition. Human health cannot be considered in isolation. And the devastating and unprecedented impact of COVID-19 underscores the urgency for global cooperation, not just in this health space, but across social, economic and environmental challenges. Uh, so looking at how we might underpin human with planetary health could be something that MICTA might contribute to in the future. As governments shift from their response into a recovery mode and think about the opportunities for cooperation, we might think about the opportunity to deliver a double dividend outcome, maximising the investments that we're each making now into economic recovery to achieve better health outcomes, but also climate friendly, sustainable growth on local, regional and global scales. And the need for this has never been more compelling. Australia and Indonesia have some, some good uh, examples where they're operating together in some of these areas. I think that can easily be, be shared across the MICTA nations um, so that each is able to support the other through collaborative research, through capacity building and through shared examples of good practice. Working together through formal and informal diplomatic mechanisms, through public and traditional diplomacy, we should be looking to a longer term vision to lift ambitions right across the globe and to bring substance to the idea that someone mentioned much earlier around how we can go about building back better. So I'll leave it there and um, pass on back to the chair, Professor Choi. Okay, thank you for your comments. And the Professor Byrne actually argues that the, she actually agree with that the middle power has a lot of potential in promoting multilateral cooperation, but we need to focus on the, the issues of the compliance and the commitment. And then also she provided uh, proposed very useful suggestions for promoting multilateral cooperation by the mid powers. And uh, our last the discussant is the Professor Erika Riz Sandoval, a seed from Mexico. And then she will give the comments on both presentations. And could you start, please? Thank you very much, Professor Choi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I thank all the organizers uh, for having us meet even if it's through through Zoom, but it's always uh, worth it to exchange ideas. Um, I also have to say I, I, I have a, a close relationship with MICTA because I've worked with it from both an academic perspective and a public policy perspective. Um, the reporting by which we decided to participate in MICTA in Mexico uh, was basically written on my desk. And um, I was also a senior official for MICTA. So I do know both worlds. I know how we academics try and, and 
um, give attributes to these creations uh, in many ways and sometimes are frustrated by the fact that there's a capabilities expectations gap that we don't seem to understand. But I've also worked with it from the public policy perspective and I know it's hard uh, to move the car forward and, and convince people that this is a useful resource. Um, I have to say that COVID-19 uh, and as, I was, as we have seen through the discussions during the whole day, um, has basically revealed uh, many things about the world we live in that perhaps we knew deep, deep uh, down inside us, but we were not willing to acknowledge. Uh, I think at this point in time, it was as if we went through an X-ray machine and finally discovered that we have some tumors, some broken bones and and some things lacking that we need to fix if we want to continue with our lives in terms of the general international community. Um, I think we also tend to say that we're all in this together. Um, yes, we are going through the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, even within MICTA, we're not in the same boat, I think. Uh, Professor Parler's tables are very revealing in terms of the differences uh, that the pandemic has created among our countries. Uh, the number of deceased people is definitely not comparable from Mexico to Korea, for example. I mean, Korea is talking about 300 something deaths. Well, we are, uh, the, the data for today is 72,000 dead people as acknowledged by the government. So we're in very different universes in that sense. Um, I think uh, we're depending perhaps too much on historical analogies and we're trying to find our way through these historical analogies, but we're going through a very new and different uh, era uh, and we're moving towards the unknown basically and that creates a lot of uncertainty and of fear. And fear is, is definitely a bad counselor for everybody, for policymakers, for academics, for researchers. Uh, we should try and prevent falling into, into the abyss of fear because that will not allow us to think clearly. The other danger I think, and, I've, and we've seen it through um, the discussions today is that we're thinking from a static perspective. We're thinking that we're gonna come out of this the same way we entered it. Uh, that we are still gonna be middle powers, that we're still gonna be middle income countries that we're still going to be having that same space in the international scenario that we think we deserve or have, and that we don't know for sure. Because for many of our countries, uh, even within MICTA, the reality at the end will be very different, uh, at least for, from the predictions in terms of uh, GDP fall, in the case of Mexico, almost 12% this year, uh, the number of poor people that are going to enter that sector of the population is going to be huge. We're talking about 10 million in Mexico. So I think that positions us in a very different place from the one we had in 2013 when we started talking about MICTA. Um, I think also that with MICTA, we've taken a really long time to build MICTA. Uh, that is not a criticism, it's a fact. Uh, we've had a lot of trouble trying to define it. What is it? We just keep spelling it out. What's MICTA? Well, it's Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, and Australia. But we're still having trouble saying if it's a partnership, if it's, a, if it's an informal grouping, if it's a space. Uh, in Spanish, we call it a space, whatever that means. Uh, and it gives us a lot of trouble if we don't even know what we are and what we're here for. Um, Definitions also include that we are the bathroom break group from the G20. Uh, well, that's, that's okay, but we still need to do something else. And, and we've done a lot of soul searching. And I think we can see that through all the communiques and the statements we've published uh, as MICTA. I mean, we've talked about everything, terrorism, Ebola, um, you know, catastrophes, now COVID-19. We're trying to find our, our place and, and thinking about Global health governance as a possible niche is a good idea. I think it, it, it's, it's the topic du jour. Uh, we definitely could find a place there, but we all we cannot forget that it's being geopoliticized 
uh, health it has become another tool of geopolitics. And we've seen it with the uh, vaccine, as Professor Choi uh, just explained, the rich countries are getting uh, a, a greater access to the vaccine uh, and, and all the others are trying to make an equitable and inclusive distribution of the vaccine because again, we're all going through the same storm, but we don't all have the same means to participate in a war for the vaccine or in a race for the vaccine. And, and although the multilateral solution seems obvious, seems logical, we should all work together to get this done or, or worked out the best way possible, uh, it doesn't seem to be politically feasible at this point in time. And I don't know if Mikta has the clout at this point in time to, to choose global health governance as the niche, uh, because all of a sudden it's not, it's not a, a soft issue or, or something where collaboration is obvious, but it has become weaponized in a sense. It has become part of the, of the clash between great powers of, of the race for more and more space within the international scene. Um, I think we've taken a long time, but I also think we've learned a lot from each other in terms of how to deal with each other. Um, it was mentioned by Professor Fitriani. Um, we, we didn't know each other. Mexico is really, really far away. I once had to travel to, to Indonesia and I discovered that uh, it was exactly on the opposite side of the world. It took the same amount of time to travel through the Atlantic or through the Pacific for me. Um, so it, we're definitely far away in that sense. And so we didn't know each other before. And now we're learning the ropes of how to deal with each other and what are our strengths and our weaknesses, etc. It also is important to remember what Professor Fitriani mentioned. We're not a priority for our governments uh, as MICTA. MICTA seems to be an afterthought many times. Uh, it's something that once we work with it, seems logical and seems useful, but it takes a lot of effort to, to get the wills together to actually think about MICTA and, and use it as a tool, as a resource, as, as, as something that increases our, our power, our voice, or gives us a, a better standing in the world. So I think at this, um, there are many writings these days about what the world after COVID-19 will be like. And I think we're seeing a huge return of politics. And in that sense, I think Mikta should also think about that. We need to learn to speak the language of politics. We need to figure out a way to be political in this world and to express our will and, and perhaps the will of other middle powers and of other regions that are just trying to be seen in the world today when we're going back to the, the whole great power clash. Uh, and as Professor Choi mentioned, the balance of power world again, uh, we cannot play a role there. We were not gonna balance one power against another. So we definitely need to find another space. Um, so in the end, I, I do believe that we should first start at home, start at MICTA. Let's improve ourselves before we decide to, to go and venture into the unknown with whatever niche we can find, we can work with together. Uh, I think the other logical niche as Professor Perlar mentioned is um, sustainable development, the environment, climate change. Uh, this is coming and it's coming strong to our own countries. Uh, so we definitely have something to do there and we've learned a lot of the pandemic. Now, I was just asking uh, a friend of mine in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico, have the MICTA scientists met uh, to talk about COVID-19? Not yet. It's in the works, but not yet. Well, uh, I think it's high time they met. I think uh, we've done a lot of top-down MICTA. We need to do a lot more bottom-up MICTA and a lot more of connecting communities and exchanging experiences. If the scientists in MICTA have not met yet, that means we haven't learned from each other yet uh, useful lessons about the pandemic, how we've dealt with it, how we've made mistakes or what are our good things in terms of dealing with the pandemic. Well, again, it's high time we started doing that first among the MICTA members, and then we can go and see if we have a place uh, in the world for us middle powers uh, to talk about important and relevant issues in the world to come. Thank you so much. 
Okay, Professor, Professor Sandoval, and uh, Professor Sandoval mentioned that despite of the similar status among MIGTA countries, but there are still, you know, very, you know, big differences among the member states. Therefore, we consider these you know, differences more seriously and try to find a way to coordinate those differences. And thank you for your comments. And then now we will go back to the presenters. And then actually three discussants give the very important and useful comments on the two presentations. If two presenters has, you know, want to respond to those comments, please do so. But within uh, three minutes, would be greatly appreciated. Yeah. Thank Dr. You, Dr. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Professor Choi. And thank you, Professor uh, Choi Hyun Jun, for commenting on my presentation. I, I think uh, your uh, comments are very, very useful to enhance more our understanding on the circumstances that are facing by MIGTA at the moment, especially when you mentioned the uh, balance of power politics among major powers that really a uh, problem for us now in the era of uh, COVID-19. Uh, before COVID-19 era, it's already made difficult. But with this kind of circumstances, it's um, put us much more difficult uh, situation. But your last uh, explanation about uh, WHO effort to pull resources of 170 countries to uh, for a kind of cooperation, multilateral cooperation to provide uh, a vaccine, I think is a kind of hopeful also for us. It's sure to us that actually, uh, yes, major power have a competition, but doesn't mean that we cannot do anything else apart from their competition. So, uh, and this effort by WHO on the uh, collaboration on the uh, vaccine, I think is one of the area that MITA can uh, uh, enhance its position. And I agree with uh, uh, Kathleen and uh, Dr. Uh, and, and Erica uh, that it is time for MIGTA to show and to realize our potential. There is no better time. Perhaps this is the time uh, to, to show that MIGTA is uh, relevant and it is useful. Uh, because uh, in this kind of circumstances, uh, MIGTA has potential. And we can start uh, from collaboration on the vaccine, perhaps. Uh, collaboration on the providing uh, uh, a better uh, ideas on the global health governance uh, to go beyond vaccine. So to, to think our world beyond vaccine. But I think maybe in the short term, thinking about how can these five countries in MICTA can also Sorry, this is a Friday morning time, so it's very noisy in, in Jakarta and in Indonesia, as particularly. I think it's so. Uh, in this uh, COVID era, I think uh, MIGTA can also uh, collaborate to push forward some some uh, some arrangement for a fair access and inclusive access for the vaccine. Maybe we should push uh, Minister of Health in its country, or maybe scholars on public health in each of our country to start to meet together. I can encourage my colleague from the Faculty of Public Health to, to, to get in touch, or maybe if we can facilitate them to get in touch and start discussion. Start discussion, how can, uh, because it is their area, public health, but maybe we can support them from behind, uh, start thinking about more possibility for, for these five countries to collaborate. And then later on, maybe uh, scholars like us in international relations can join them to discuss on uh, what we think uh, more fair and global governance uh, for the future. So just uh, the, the, my assessment is very much uh, start to pin down our macro uh, discussion to a more realistic or maybe possible step ahead for MICTA 
to show its relevance. So thank you again for all uh, panelists for your uh, commentary. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, Dr. Paradar, do you have a yeah? Actually, could you turn on the Dr. Paradar? We cannot hear you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think they, yeah, they did. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Caitlin and Erika for their fruitful comments uh, to my paper. And I fully share with their uh, suggestions, especially with Catherine's suggestion about uh, um, about preparing compliance reports, perhaps, uh, I don't know, in two, two years ago when I was first invited to a MICTA uh, academic dialogue by an Indonesian uh, colleague working in the Minister of Indonesian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I had uh, written uh, in my email that perhaps we can think of uh, establishing a sort of uh, MICTA working group uh, and uh, trying to publish compliance reports as did uh, University of Toronto, uh, as did by, um, by university as, as uh, John Kirtan and his team are doing any uh, after uh, annual, each annual uh, submit. So I think it can be useful. It can be a useful tool in order to increase uh, the functionality of MICTA in the eyes of its members. Because I think the problem, uh, one of the biggest problem of MICTA is related with uh, the uh, with its uh, with the belonging of uh, with the problem related with. Uh, the ideational problems, I think. For example, uh, I, I would like to uh, talk about a little, a little bit talk about with Turkey's uh, uh, Turkish idea about Bikta. When I first uh, did my when I did my first research on Turkey's uh, position in Bikta and how Turkey look at Bikta, etc., I realized that uh, Turkey doesn't have a real middle power identity. So perhaps this is why Turkey has. Uh, adopted a lower stance against MICTA. So this kind of socialization, socialization problems exist among members. So uh, MICTA, please, uh, as scholars, we must accept uh, MICTA as an evolving structure, as an evolving grouping. So uh, socialization is still uh, ongoing. So uh, while uh, looking at MICTA's policies or while considering MICTA's deficiencies, and potentialities, we must always take into account this uh, ongoing socialization process. It is an evolving structure. Um, I think uh, this is a very uh, important uh, proposition. Uh, compliance reports can increase uh, members, MICTA members' uh, understanding of, of MICTA. And perhaps this can help them push themselves uh, to comply with their own commitments uh, done in the at the annual submits or at the foreign ministers' uh, meetings, uh, etc. Uh, another uh, comment which was very interesting uh, was uh, Erika's comment regarding uh, regarding the different uh, possibilities, the different uh, uh, stories of each MICTA member. I think you are right. Each MICTA member has different uh, story, has has uh, different trajectories. Uh, but this pandemic can create a uh, good opportunity for uh, MICTA members to create a common ground and to take common positions against a common problem, which is uh, pandemic. Now we are at the stage of uh, we are at the we are not at the at the initial stage of uh, the uh, pandemic outbreak. So uh, during the distribution of vaccine, and during the uh, research on vaccine, uh, perhaps this common space can be uh, functionalized and can be much more uh, oper operationalized uh, among members. Uh, another important topic regarding MICTA's future uh, policies is, uh, as I stated in my uh, presentation, perhaps I, I forgot, I couldn't uh, go into details about this topic, is about MICTA's possible role in a global, in a, uh, global health assistance. I think it is very important if uh, MICTA members can uh, act collectively uh, in uh, development cooperation, especially in the field of health sector, uh, 
uh, this can be uh, this can also improve a uh, MICTA status because as you know most of the uh, MICTA members are important donors in the international development sector so if they can come together and they can uh, uh, collaborate uh, to give a common response to uh, the third countries to the least developed countries and to create a loan or I don't know what kind of structure, what kind of framework they can uh, create. Uh, this can also be uh, very useful uh, for uh, raising uh, MICTAS visibility and impact. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. And then now actually we have only five minutes left, but the, the online audience sent us uh, many interesting questions. So I actually selected a couple of them, but since we don't have uh, enough time to cover all the questions, I actually would like to pick up one very simple and you know, very strong questions. So the question is, that what would be the most urgent task for this MICTA cooperation in terms of the, the health you know, governance? And then the second, you know, it's kind of the same question. And the, what kind of, you know, what is the most important values this MICTA cooperation should pursue? So my question is, what is the most urgent task? And then what, what kind of the, you know, values that these MICTA countries should pursue for their multilateral cooperation? The, you know, this question is open for the every panelist. So any volunteer? Okay. Can I, oh, go ahead. Can can I can I try to answer the first question? I think maybe cooperation uh, to if we do not produce, but at least we uh, dis, uh, distribute a vaccine for for all. Uh, uh, for at least we collaborate to 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 prove that Nikta is useful and relevant. Collaborate in vaccine. Uh, not maybe product distribution. Uh, can also distribution or uh, research uh, is also still possible because what vaccine doing now is making under pressure and maybe it's not a perfect so maybe Mikta can slowly develop a better vaccine by start collaboration I think it's to prove that our our relevance this maybe for the first question thank you Maybe I'll jump in as well now. Oh, sorry, Professor Choi, were you speaking? Okay. Um, I, I wonder if there's an opportunity for MICTA nations to fairly urgently share experiences on test and tracing. One of the things I thought was so interesting is the very different experiences uh, that have occurred across the different MICTA countries. And yet, we have also all had spikes in outbreaks in different parts and we've responded to those differently. Uh, so I think we can learn a lot from each other just in how we've been managing uh, the testing and tracing process and how that has helped to suppress uh, the pandemic in communities. The other area I would say we need to urgently uh, talk about further is the impact of COVID-19 on women, uh, whether that relates to women in healthcare, women uh, in the workforce, and women um, experiencing more domestic violence. We know that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate impact on women in all of those domains, and we should be doing more to actually address that. Uh, I think that will be a key issue for the G20, hopefully. Uh, going forward, then that's something we could potentially get some traction on. Okay, thank you. And actually, time's up. So this is all for this session. And I would like to thank you all the panelists and audiences for their active participation. And I hope all of us, all of you, can stay healthy and strong. And thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. Thank you.